thank you very much for a, a fascinating and, and delightful, I might say, lecture. Um, the thing that worries me is L. Yes. And, and rightly so. It, it, <laughs> I, I kind of imagine that if you rearrange the Drake equation to make L the thing on the left-hand side, then you, you can say, well, this is some boundaries of L. And I presume that the more you investigate, the more you can constrain the boundaries of L. What are they at the moment? Well, they're completely open-ended. So we so and because again there are there are, there are what 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 can we say about our own civilization? We've had the capability of destroying our civilization certainly for the last fifty years. We haven't done so yet. You could argue this does prove that technological species with a very um, how should we say in um, inefficiently organised geopolitical structure in possession of nuclear weapons, can at least survive for 50 years. Maybe we've proved that. But one couldn't you know, put any degree of confidence on that, looking at, looking at the world today. On the other hand, L is, L is if, if civilizations, if, if life were common and, tech, and, and intelligence were common, there will, of course, be a spectrum of socio-political arrangements amongst all these extraterrestrials. Some of them may be organized on an even worse base than we are, and, and they may well be ex ex extinct themselves rapidly. But you could argue that others may be in a much better place. I mean, suppose intelligent life had evolved on Earth uh, before the Pangaea supercontinent broke up. Then there was only one geographically inhabited large island. May, uh, maybe the geopolitical histories would have been different. Maybe we wouldn't have 200 nation states armed to the teeth uh, fighting each other. So, uh, we, so we know nothing. So you're right. All we, eventually, though, we may be able to... If we explore the... If we, get, if we were to get numbers to all the other terms in the Drake equation that we were confident with, you could then use that to constrain L. But at the moment, it's, the, it's one of those terms in, 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 in the equation that must remain speculative because it, it could go from zero years to a million years. I believe there was a question upstairs and then we'll take a question uh, over there as well. Thank you. Uh, it's pretty expensive searching this balance. Oh, sorry, I can't, can't see you because the light's in my eye. Where? Uh... Right at the top. Right at the top. Oh, oh, sorry, I certainly can't see you up there. Right, okay. <laughs> Shielding it's pretty expensive from the light. searching this boundless universe for life. How are we going on at the other end, trying to make it in the laboratory? So you want you want, let me um, you want to talk for my colleague at UCL, Nick Lane, because he's trying to do exactly that. He has a little reactor in his base in the basement at UCL where he's trying to simulate what he's trying. One of the so where where did life originate? We don't know. There are a range of possibilities. One possibility is hydrothermal vents at the bottom of oceans where warm water interacts with well, water interacts with hot rocks and non-equilibrium chemistry can be generated. So Nick has in his laboratory an artificial hydrothermal vent in which he's trying to see how complicated the biochemistry can get. Uh, nothing, nothing has crawled out of it yet, to my, <laughs> to my knowledge. But I would, I would recommend you, if you're interested in this, I, I would recommend you get Nick to give a talk. It would be a very, very good, good talk on the origin of life. There's one on, his, uh, on our YouTube channel, actually. He gave a talk here a couple of years ago. Okay, so there you go. Uh, or you could read his book, The, the Vital Question, which he, he wrote a couple of years ago, which gives the, the, um, the best up-to-date description of current thinking on the origin of life that I'm aware of. So, so John, there was a lady there, I think, had a question? Oh. Well, of course, there may well be. So we've got, we've got the evidence of our own carbon water-based life on Earth, and that's what we're going around the universe searching for, because it's, it's all we know. The universe is a very big place, so it's essential that we keep an open mind as to other possibilities. I mean, I, I can list the arguments for why carbon-based biochemistry is likely to be more efficient than other possibilities, like silicon-based biochemistry that's sometimes talked about, and why water is a f probably the most useful solvent to, for this biochemistry to occur in, to enable it. But again, there are other possibilities. So I think we have to keep an open mind. As we go out into the universe looking, we should definitely be open to the possibility that there are other forms of life might be present. But of course, if, the, if other forms of life are present, that just makes the problem worse. It makes it even more strange that we haven't discovered anything. If in addition to all of these billions and billions of planets that could support our form of life, sort of life, 
Uh, we haven't found anything. But there are also billions and billions of planets that could support completely separate forms of life as well. Then there's even more possibilities for life out there, and yet still we haven't found any. So in a sense, it would make, it would make the, the paradox even deeper. Do you want to move this question now? Is there another term in Drake's equation which is something to do with uh, the probability of the planet of the star being of sufficient generations to generate the materials we need? So, yeah, I mean, it's a good question. Obviously, the Drake equation, as it was originally formulated, is a very simplistic thing. In, in reality, we have to be aware of the fact that the galaxy has been evolving chemically, as you said. So, you could have argued, in fact, Five years ago, I would have argued that, that you might want to restrict your consideration to stars that are formed within either the sun's age or only a bit older than the sun, because earlier stars might not have sufficient chemical heavy elements, because you need star, you need, earlier generations of stars have to go through all their life cycles to make everything heavier than helium. Um, and you have to have a time for this to happen. So as time goes on, the galaxy gets more and more concentrated in elements heavier than helium, and these are what you need to make stars and when well, planets and life out of. On the other hand, it's now becoming clear for our studies of galaxies at very large redshifts, where we're seeing them in the very early universe, that the abundances of heavier elements did, did build up really quickly, probably because the first generation of stars, very massive, Astronomers call them type 3, population 3 stars. Stars that were very massive. They didn't contain any heavy elements themselves yet because none had been made. But they ended their lives in very short timescales as supernovae within a few million years of forming. Do actually seem to have built up the heavy element abundance in the universe very rapidly. So I'm, no, I'm now no longer sure that you've got this temporal way out <laughs> uh, from the Drake equation. And in fact, some stars have now been found. There's a, you, can, you can Google it. I think, um, I think the record is Kepler-444. This is a, um, one of the stars in the Kepler catalogue of exoplanetary systems. That's about, uh, if memory serves, 11.7 billion years old. And its, it's, 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 it's abundance of heavy elements is about the same as the sun's, despite being much older. And it has a planetary system. <laughs> So I think, I think you know, we can no longer appeal to the fact that the galaxy has only become habitable within the last four billion years because it took that long to build up enough heavy elements. I think that argument's sort of been disproved now. I think there's one more question just behind there. Thank you. Uh, your title was Where Are the Aliens? And you haven't really discussed the possibility that maybe they're here already. Uh, they're so, disguised as humans. Maybe they don't communicate in the same place that we're looking at. Mm. And it leads to the question, have we got a too narrow definition of what is an alien? So I think, so strictly you're right. So obviously all sorts of things could be possible. If there were technologies out there much more in advance than, than our own, of course they might be out there, they might be hiding, and they might be, uh, for all we know, yes, disguised as humans. Their avatars might be in, in this room. I mean, you, you, have to, you, have to, you have to admit that a sufficiently advanced technology would be able to do that. On the other hand, it doesn't really look like that kind of situation can have grown out of the universe as we currently see it. Because if there were a handful of such super intelligent aliens at the very top of the pyramid... There must be millions of planets inhabited with life with, which have never got to that you know, level. So I still think that uh, I still think the, the the evidence so the evidence is not really strong, uh, and this is why we have to get out into the universe and explore it more fully. But it doesn't look to me like you can have a, a universe with a, a really super intelligence at the top, which is hiding from us and ourselves, and nothing in between. And it's the things in between that we still might expect to discover and haven't. Fantastic. Well, I think uh, that, that just about wraps up uh, this session. So could you please join me again in uh, thanking Ian for a fantastic talk. Thank you.